like that. I hope it's yours. It says here, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? But then it goes on, it says, but how will they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear unless somebody goes to tell them? And how will they go to tell them unless somebody sends them? You know what? I think that I draw the right conclusion when I say there is a place for every one of us in the Great Commission. It's not all the same, but it isn't going to work unless all of us are working together. But let me read it to you in a little bit different version. Uh, English is one of the languages that I speak, but, uh, and English is really good for giving directions. If you want to get someplace, never ask somebody in Spanish. Aquí cito, aquí cito nomás. It's just, oh, right down here, you can't miss it. And, and, and then maybe you take a right or a left. It's just, oh, you can't miss this, right? But now, if you want to tell your wife or somebody that you want to be, that you love her, don't use English. It, here's, here's God's word in a language that most of you haven't heard. It's really the same book. This is the Jesus book. Can you see that? It is the Jesus book, isn't it? <laughs> and you know what's coming now? The before Jesus book. <laughs> this is the Jesus book. It's Hawaiian pigeon. And I read it because it makes me think a little bit. It's halfway between English and the language that Minkai and I speak. This is what it says here. It says... This is for the Rome people. It says, whoever trusts God, no way they're going to come shame. Because God's going to do everything what he say. Do you believe that? Hold on, it goes. Before. It says, everybody that asks the boss for help him, he's going to take them out of the bad kind of stuff they're doing. <laughs> now here's where you all come in. It says, but hey, how are they going to ask him for help him if they no trust him? And how are they going to trust him if they never hear nothing about him? And how are they going to hear about him if nobody ever know go tell them nothing about him? <laughs> and how are they going to tell people if nobody send them for go teach? Have you found yourself in there yet? And then, and then listen, I think of this as the Jar Jar Binks Bible. You old folks won't understand that, but <laughs> younger ones will. This is how it ends up. It says, just like the Bible say, when people go for tell the good stuff from God, hey, that's so awesome. <laughs> Folks, in God's kingdom, he has no hierarchy except for this. He distinguishes those people who are willing to let him use them and those who aren't. That's the only distinction that I find in here. If he can use somebody like Abraham who lacked so much faith that he wasn't even willing to tell the people honestly who his wife was, then he can use you and me. If he could use David, who kept messing up and whose only redeeming feature was that he really was humble before God, he can use you and me. Folks, I think that's the bottom line. It isn't about celebrity. It isn't even about which stories God publishes. It's about those of us who are willing to let God write our story. When I was five, my world came apart. My dad was my hero. My whole little boy universe revolved around him. Everything that was important to me in life included my dad. I used to get up in the morning and I would go out and I would watch my dad load his little yellow airplane to fly off into the jungles. And I would stand on a little bank beside our house and watch that little plane disappear into the jungles. And then I'd play and do whatever little boys do. But in the afternoon when I would hear my mom giving the weather report to my dad, I knew that he was coming home and I'd go and I'd stand up on that little bank with great anticipation because my dad was coming back. And I'd watch out over a little ridge that we called Penny Ridge, and I could just see the dot of his airplane as it would appear over Penny Ridge. Can you imagine the anticipation in my heart when I would see that little dot? 
It was exciting every day. Even telling you about it, I feel excited because I knew my dad was coming back and my world would be complete. And then one day my mom called me into her room after I'd been waiting for several days on the bank. And she said, Stevie boy, your daddy's never coming home again. I knew she was wrong. I knew that couldn't be right. What would there be to live for if my dad wasn't coming home? How could my dad keep his promise because my dad had promised me that he was going to teach me to fly that little plane and he was going to teach me to fix it. And I knew he couldn't keep that promise if he didn't come back and so I knew my mom was wrong. And then I found out the harsh and tragic, terrible news that my mom was right. My dad never came back. And my little life was shattered. You know what I hadn't learned yet? I hadn't learned yet that when God writes the story of our lives, He doesn't promise that all the chapters will be easy. That's not in the book. But you know what He does promise? He promises that in the last chapter, if we let Him write the story, in the last chapter He'll make sense of all the other chapters. But brothers and sisters, we have to wait for the last chapter. And you know what our... You know what our great opportunity is in those hard chapters? It is to show our loving Heavenly Father that we do trust Him and we do love Him and that we want Him to be the author of our lives. And in North America, it's probably more difficult than any place in the world because we worship the plan. And we've been telling each other over and over and over that we have to dream great dreams for God and plan great things for God. And I think that that's the most asinine thing that the church has ever come up with. Do you believe that the God of the universe who spoke everything that exists into existence by, his, by the power of His Word, can He possibly need us? I don't think so. In Genesis 1.16 it says that that God created the greater light to rule over the day and the lesser light to rule over the night. I remember when we sent the Hubble Space Telescope up into space after spending a billion dollars and it wouldn't focus. <laughs> and, then, and then we spent another billion dollars trying to get it to focus. And then the government, because they wanted us to feel like we'd gotten our money's worth, they, uh, they started giving us pictures. And I remember in National Geographic there was a three-page fold-out and... It just showed thousands of little points of light. But up in the upper right-hand corner, I think it was, there was a little box that showed us where this picture was taken. It was a picture taken of the emptiest place in space, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And, you know, I was interested because $2 billion is a lot of money. And so I looked there, and it said, on the caption, it said, most of the point, or some of the points of light in this picture are stars. The majority of them are galaxies. And I thought, what a waste, God. He, he made billions of stars that we hadn't ever known about until we spent billions of dollars so we could see it. And who cared anyway? <laughs> no, no, that's not the point. The point is that I realized that God had made billions of stars out there and we didn't know anything about them. And you know how he did it? He did it with he did it with the power of his voice. And I felt so insignificant when I realized that the God of the universe who made everything that I see, including those billions of stars that we never knew even existed, that for some unimaginable reason, he has entrusted his good news for the world to you and to me.